tonight, Mark? We said that we're on chapter 3, verse 12. Chapter 3, verse 12. So let's review a bit where we are in our third chapter, Karma Yoga, and why we do it. If we seek to meditate and engage in vigorous self-inquiry and meditate for long hours, and it's difficult. And I have what we call vasana pressure, meaning the pressure of the force of my past actions is so intense that I'm restless, and I'm discontent, and I have to have, I've been held into activity. Yoga says, don't fight it. Suppression of our desires, suppression of our activity is not healthy. We may think, oh, I want to go off to India and live in a cave in the Himalayas. But if we've got a lot of vasana pressure, you're just going to be squirming up there. And the next thing you know, you're going to be wanting to make social contact and make friends and be doing this and then get involved with that and go there and meet these people. And I meet somebody, you know, stuff like that. All that pressure. No blame. We can't turn these things off like a light switch. So the tradition says, aha, you're a prime candidate for karma yoga. This is for the vast majority of us. So what's the first? How do you own someone here? Ghosts. First principle. Act. We do not achieve freedom by endeavoring to cease acting. 
You're going to act anyway. How? According to your inherent latent proclivities, according to your desires. You're auspicious to your desires. Stuff that's healthy. We call this your split karma. Doesn't mean, oh, I want to go do drug, sex, and rock and roll. You may have to do that until you suffer. But chances are, for most of us, we've put that kind of stuff behind us. Act in the world according to our Swadharma. Last week, we were introduced to this idea of yagya. Yagya means a sacrifice. The mystic symbolism is based on the Vedic sacrifice. Uh, does your family do homa on yes. occasion? Yes. Okay. Describe to us, if you will, for the non-Indians, wh what happens when you do homa. First you do a puja to make the space, and then you start the fire, and then you do oblations into the fire. What do you do? The, what are the oblations? Um, depending on the homam, it's a uh, different mantras to the primary deity and the associated deities, and you're offering the avati into the fire. But these are words the Westerners say. Uh, you're yeah. offering a mixture of herbs and spices into the fire with each oblation, each chant that you say, um, and then once for most for many of the bigger homams. Um, once the, the fire offerings are pretty much complete, then you also nowadays cut a pumpkin, which is symbolic of a lamb or a sheep. And then after that, you, you do like the final offering, um, which is like a, a bundle of a bunch of different things. Yes. So this is the Vedic sacrifice, the yagya. And we can broaden the definition, any puja. So if you've got a mandir in your home and you're doing a particular puja to say a Lakshmi puja, then you offer flowers and things like that. But the best metaphor for this is in many, many Indian homes. When mother cooks dinner, she puts food in a tali. She takes it over the mandir and offers it to the rock. Then we sit down and have dinner. Whose family did that on a somewhat regular basis? Yeah. So what's the symbolism of that? We don't cook food for ourselves. We cook food for the God. We eat leftovers. We get the prasad, the remnant of the sacrifice. So this is the overarching metaphor that Vyasa is using here. So now let's redefine our terms. The deva is the presiding principle over human endeavor. So... Anand was doing, well, I remember your pop-up restaurant and your food videos and things like that. So you're propitiating the food god. So you're uh, doing capital uh, investment. Uh, uh, what do you call it when you raise money for other people? Fundraising. Fundraising, yeah. So you're propitiating the fundraising you're a social worker, you're propitiating the social worker God. Uh, Vinayak, he's a scientist and a, an engineer and inventor. That's the presiding principle you propitiate. And the point of the yajna metaphor is we don't engage in the world for our greedy, selfish ends. I want to make all this money. I want to be important. I want to have a title. I want to impress my friends. I want to become financially independent so I don't have to work anymore. All this kind of selfishness, which frankly, 
a whole lot of people motivate from, especially in the U.S. Gita says, that's going to make you suffer. It will grossify your mind. Instead, you have a new employer. Who do you work for, Shopa? God. Yeah, you got it. If you're in sales, who are your customers? God. If you're a musician, who are you working for? God. Who's in the audience? God. So we sanctify our work. Serve something greater than our own egos. The person who cooks food for him or herself verily eats sin. Krishna said last week. All right. So, Deepa, will you help us out? 12th verse? Yes. Just a second. Let me put it up. Okay. She's a base this morning. Oh. Uh, Your voice is low. Can you hear me? <laughs> hear you very well. Okay. It's it's low because I meditated, I think, I guess. <laughs> um Ishtan Bogan Hivo Deva Dasyante Yagya Bhavitaha Ter Tera Dattana Pradaye Bhyo Bhunte Stena Evasa. The devas, nourished by the sacrifice, will give you the desired objects. Indeed, he who enjoys objects given by the devas without offering in return to them is verily a thief. Yes. Now, can you all hear uh, Adipa? Can you folks hear her? Yes. Okay. So, here again, following our metaphor that the devas, the presiding principle, if you don't put energy into what the presiding principle is, you're verily a thief. Now, what does he mean by that? I have a neighbor. He's got this job. And he's been screwing around by spending. He works at home. He's got this, you know, he telecommutes. But he's spending four hours a day on his phone, scrolling through the apps. And now he's got, I think they call it a PIP, a P-I-P. What's that stand for? Performance Improvement Plan. Performance Improvement Plan. What happens when you get a PIP? Probation. You get fired. Yeah. You're on your way to losing your job. Why? Because you're not serving the God. So one of my slogans that I like to say, you know how a government worker is like a broken rifle? It won't work and you can't fire it. <laughs> Many people think my ideal job is to go work for a bureaucracy, maybe the government, where I have total job security, no matter how poorly I do or how much I screw off, they can't fire me and I can phone it in. I don't have to strive for excellence. Sure, none of you have ever worked with this kind of attitude. But you may know friends who have. Now, you may have the job for a long time. But how do you usually feel about the eight hours a day that you put into that? It's so crushing. And what do we tend to do if we've got a work attitude like that? When we leave work, we're so unhappy because we're so alienated. 
from the work situation. First thing we want to do is deal with how unhappy we are. Let's have a beer. Let's open a bottle of wine. Let's light a joint. What do I want to do? Basically, a person then reduces the rest of their life to just their animal needs. It's a devolutionary way of life. So if you can't stand your job and the only reason you're there is because it's safe and secure, you're ripping off yourself and you're ripping off the universe. If you want to be an artist and you're stuck being an accountant and you're afraid to leave that job, even though you hate being an accountant, there's somebody else who's a waiter who really wants to be an accountant. You've got their slot in the universe. Do you see that? So that's how the society gets out of balance. So this Swadharma is written in our hearts. You are ripping off not only yourself, but the larger society. When we do not work, according to our Swadharma, in the Yajna spirit. Now, I went to the symphony today. A very dear friend of mine who, when he was younger, he has Parkinson's now, so it's, he's not able to, to do it anymore, but he was a very, very fine amateur piano player. And I asked the one question that's essential. I won't mention his name. Did you enjoy practicing? Oh yes, I loved to practice. I'll never be a Yuja Wang. She's the one of the big stars out now. It's a international pianist. But he was a good amateur because he loved to put in the work. He didn't have to force himself to do it. Back when I was teaching music. I could tell right away if I had a singer, because I was a voice teacher. Do you want to be a musician or do you want to be a celebrity? They are not the same thing. You don't get any guarantee about being successful or a celebrity. But the good news is if you do what you love, you've got the greatest chance of being successful. Because you don't have to force yourself to do the work. You do it out loud. So this is why it's so important to do what you love. And if right now you aren't doing what you love, you start by endeavoring to love what you do. Pay attention to what you enjoy doing, not having, not getting. Now, if we've been alienated from work for a long time, and I ask the question, you had all the money in the world, all the education in the world, all the talent in the world, what would you be doing? Oh, I'd be on a beach in the Bahamas. I'd be cruising on ships around the world. Well, that actually gets boring pretty fast. We are designed to work. Now, it can be very simple. It doesn't have to be something really, really uh, sensational. You may enjoy being a housewife or a house husband. 
keeping house, raising children, that may really, really fulfill you. You don't have to be a nuclear physicist. Maybe what you really enjoy is supporting someone who's really talented. Not being the person in the spotlight. You have to figure it out for yourself. The guru can tell you what you're supposed to do. All right. Question. Yes, sir. What about the parts of what you love? Like you're doing what you love, but you get to the parts that you don't love about it. I can only talk with you about my own personal experience. Very, very early on in my life, I made the commitment to only work at a job I love. And I can honestly say for 50 some years, I've never had a job I didn't love. And every single one of them had aspects of it that weren't fun. When I was at St. Augustine doing a job I adore as a music director, a whole lot of that time was filing music after we'd sung and putting together notebooks of music that nobody else could do. Christmas time, nobody else had the knowledge to know, okay, I want a trumpet descant on the third verse for this hymn. You know, I want the uh, sopranos to sing the David Wilcox descant. You know, these are pretty arcane things which only a trained musician would know this stuff. Was it tedious getting all this stuff out of the file and putting the violin part in and the oval part in and all this, these books? It was exhausting. Not fun, but necessary. And I think every job has dimensions of that. Is that useful? Hmm. Now, if most of the job you don't like, I don't know, maybe you're doing the wrong thing. But it's never always fun all the time. That's my experience. So those, my question is, the, the way I've understood your statements is that when you love something, you don't need to be motivated by something outside of yourself. But even when you're doing something you love, there will be moments where you find it hard to be motivated internally. Well, and there's nuance on that. Some of us can clearly motivate internally. Again, I'll have just out of my own experience. If I didn't have a gig, ask me if I practice. But if I had a concert in two months, yeah, I'd practice. So if I could set the goal, then I motivate myself to do it. Sometimes it's on the outside. When I was working for St. Augustine, the church calendar set the goal. You've got Christmas coming up. And in three months, you've got Easter coming up. Summer, you can take some time off and rest. So there's, there's no firm answer to that, but it's good to know if you need an external reinforcement to get to work, or you can do it internally. That's something only you can figure out about yourself. Is that useful? Yes. Thank you. And we're all different that way. Um, one of the things I discovered, I want to be self-employed, so I don't have any limits, and you know, I'm in charge of my own time and stuff like that. If you're self-employed in a small business, you have no time off. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. Vinayak? Yeah. So much nicer to just go to work and get a paycheck. <laughs> oh, I 
can leave it there. I've done both. So there, there are challenges to anything. Please listen carefully. I am not saying that working according to your school dharma is going to answer all the problems of life. What I'm saying is doing karma yoga helps reduce vasana pressure in the end. We'll get through all the pieces. And for most of us, unless you're a trust fund kid, you got to pay the mortgage. You've got to pay the rent. You've got to do something. Even a sannyasi is not free from work. All right, next verse. Um. Yagya Shishtashina Santo Muchante Sarva Kilbishehi Bunjate Tetwagham Papa Ye Pachantyatma Karanat. The righteous who eat the, right, who eat the remnants of the sacrifices are freed from all sins. But those sinful ones who cook food only for their own sake verily eat but sin. So the exoteric meaning are those people who do not observe the proper Vedic rituals of offering food to the deity. But the deeper meaning of it has to do with our understanding of this word papa. It's usually translated as sin. We have the two words always in, in uh, tandem, papam and punya. So some people see sin or papam as living under life with the God who's somewhere between a judge and a traffic cop. Oh. I am ritually impure because I uh, touched a woman who's menstruating. Oh, pop them, pop them, you know. Or, oh dear, uh, I inadvertently touched a dead animal. Pop them, pop them. Punya, oh, I did uh, puja every day in the morning this week. Punya, punya. There. Now, That's a very limited understanding of papam and punya. By the way, Hindus are not the only ones with these kinds of uh, restrictions, laws. If you're a Jew and you're observant, Orthodox, there are 613 laws in the Hebrew Bible that an observant Jew needs to, uh, to, to observe every day. But let's redefine papam and punya for us yogis. Papam, usually translated as sin, is any action or thought which has as its result further grossification of the mind. Makes the mind thicker, denser. Punya, merit, is any action or thought that we engage in which has as its result further subtleization of the mind. Let me give you a real life example. So I was working with this person. They came in and they were a little squirrely and squirmy. I said, oh, you know, I just did something and I, I really don't like what I did. I was in the parking lot over at the drugstore. And as I was parking, 
I, I got too close to this car and I scratched it. And I got out and I looked and their car was all beat up and I could see where I'd scratched it, but I didn't think it was too bad and I left. I did not leave a note. When he got here, it was very clear that he felt crummy about himself. He didn't feel what he did was righteous. And he didn't do the right thing by his own internal code of ethics. Papa, no God is going to punish you if you scratch another person's car. Cops might. But the worst effect is it puts a stain in my mind. I feel like I was a really, you know, that was an awful thing to do. Another person calls me up. Jim, I just have to tell you the truth. I called into work and I told them I'm sick. And I'm taking the day off and I'm not sick. I just wanted to take a day off because there's not a whole lot to do at work. Why did you call me? Well, I just didn't feel good about it. Am I making sense? Problem. It is not sinful to take a day off from work. But lying makes us feel crappy. Does that make sense? You have a disagreement with someone, especially someone you care about, a dear friend or a partner, and you say something hurtful with the intention to hurt them. Well, I'm just teaching them a lesson. We have all sorts of justifications. But after the fact, oh, God, that was an awful thing to do. Papa. Someone says or does something that annoys you, and you keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Doesn't leave a stain in the body. So this is how to figure out whether it's Punya or Papa. Now, it can shift. Let me give you another example. So in the recovery community, we say for the newcomer who comes in, Give up drugs, give up alcohol. No funny cigarettes, no funny powders, no funny pills, and don't drink. But what about giving up smoking? What about giving up coffee? What about giving up sugar? We say, don't worry about that in your first year. If you try to do that stuff, you'll probably have too much to deal with and you might relapse. So for a person in their first weeks of sobriety, smoking is punya. They're going, ah! because they're detoxing emotionally off of all this stuff. I really need to smoke. It's okay. Go have a cigarette. Oh, I want to drink so bad. Eat some chocolate. Oh, I've, got, I've gained 30 pounds in my first six months of sobriety. Nobody ever got arrested for fat driving. Don't worry about it. <laughs> now, after a year, they say, I can't stand smoking anymore. I mean, <clears throat> it's just a nasty habit. I want to give it up. Okay. Let's work on that. So what was Punya? has become problem. 
you're a year sober and you've put on 30 pounds in your first year and you feel gross. All right, maybe it's time to take a look at changing your diet. You're ready to let go of eating your feelings. So eating pastry and ice cream is punya in early sobriety. A year later, it's people come into the spiritual life. We look at the scriptures, and the scriptures advise us to have a sattvic diet, eat purely, vegetarian food, light food, not a lot of meat. Stale food, stuff like that. What I say in the beginning is your body will tell you what you need to do. Just start meditating. I will say, usually in the beginning, if you want to go out and party on the weekends and get drunk and do drugs, knock yourself out. Go for it. But you're not ready for yoga yet. Do that so you don't have to do it anymore. But frequently, I will see people come to class. They take the art of meditation class, then Atma Bodha, then halfway through the Bacon Chudamani. Gee, you're looking really good. What's changed? Oh, I've made a major change in my diet. I've pretty much given up meat and, and uh, uh, heavy you know, all the sweets I used to eat and stuff like that. I just feel better. Vinayak, you did this. You lost, what, 30 pounds? Mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't happen right away, did it? No, yeah, about six or seven months. Yeah. But what would prompted you to do it? I, I was having high blood pressure about it. And I didn't want to take medication. Yeah, but you also been doing yoga you've been involved in this work so it becomes punya to give that stuff up so are you understanding this deeper teaching on punya and papa any action or thought that we engage in that grossifies the mind, makes it more dense, causes me agitation. Papa. Any action or thought that I engage in that brings me peace. Subtilizes the mind. Punya. Okay. With this understanding of Punya and Papa, Deepa, will you read the verse again in English for us? Sure. The righteous who eat the remnants of the sacrifices are freed from all sins, but those sinful ones who cook food only for their own sake verily eat but sin. So, meaning, if I live my life, Doing service. I will further purify my mind. If, on the other hand, I live life from a greedy standpoint, it's all about me getting what I want, my money, my title. My achievements, I mean mine, I mean mine, I mean mine. It will grossify the mind and make us more unhappy in the end. Now, 
If you have people in your life who live a greedy life and they seem to have it all and stuff like that, part of what we do is we compare our insides to their outsides. We have no idea in quiet moments what they think about their lives or themselves. I have a friend I was talking with just yesterday and his bank called him up and said, we'd like you to consider refinancing your house. We can give you a 10 year mortgage at zero interest with a balloon payment at the end. We'll save so much money month to month. And my friend who actually is quite active in real estate, that is a junk mortgage. That's the same kind of instrument that caused the crash in 2089. You're trying to get me to buy a piece of junk. Yeah, but it's still a good deal. And you'll maybe be able to refinance and pay off the, the balloon payment. I tell you that guy probably doesn't sleep well at night who tried to sell him the mortgage. He knows he's selling crap. Have any of you had to work at a job where what you're doing lacks integrity? Anybody found themselves in that position ever? It leaves a real stain in the mind. So, I have a question. Please. If somebody is misusing me, that also uh, make my thoughts uh, more the group together. So that also is sin, that means? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, they crucify, your thoughts get crucified if somebody is misusing you. If someone is misusing you, yeah. that's a sticky wicket. It depends on the context in which they're doing it. So for example, if you're at work, and your manager is managing by intimidation and fear, which many people do. Maybe you're in the wrong job. You have dignity. Here I can't forgive that person. Uh, well, you, you will need to understand that the reason they're doing it is because they are fearful. When, when you have tried to control others, chances are it's been because you've been fearful. And once you understand your own motivation, you may not have been to the extreme as the other person, but they, like ourselves, are perhaps spiritually sick. This is the doorway to compassion. Why do people do what they do? Bad behavior almost always has its origin in self-centered fear. You and I know what it's like to be afraid. Doesn't excuse their behavior. But you and I don't have to put up with it. Now, if I think I can't quit this job or I can't leave this relationship, I'm stuck. That's not true. Let me give you an example out of my own life. So for 13 years, I worked at St. Augustine. I had three fabulous bosses. Then another boss came and he was Indian, believe it or not. And he was not ethical. He also tried to manage by intimidation. He was dishonest. He wanted to cheat people. Now, I'm a yogi. So I would say to him, Father, that isn't ethical. And he knows I'm fearless at some deep level. I don't give a damn if he fires me. 
God's my employer. You know, over and over again, I would say to him, you know, I was kind, but I was direct. Because as yogi, we want to be fearless. Because if I work for God, then it's God's job to make sure I don't live on the streets. I just got to be attentive, keep listening, and step forward. Doesn't mean I scream and yell at them or hit them or stuff like that. But we do have a responsibility to speak truth to power. Fearlessly. Swamiji was so fearless. There would be a couple and they were dripping bangles and jewelry. You know, they were major contributors to the Chinmaya mission. And if they acted like fools, he'd just tell them. Fearless, just fearless. So we are not ever victims. Children are, they're stuck. But as adults, now, here's another spiritual principle. Nobody has the power to make me feel anything. They can have all their opinions about me they want. Truth is, aham brahmasmi, does not touch me. But even at the level of the personality, I'm a child of God. And I'm just fine, just the way I am. I'm a work in progress. Now, the opposite is also true. I don't have the power to make anybody else feel anything. I can try, but it's, it's foolishness. Let me see if I can give you an example. Well, my dear friend Susan, she's a retired uh, computer programmer. She was working in the industry when almost no women were computer programmers. Any of you women in IT come across that? And I don't think it's that way anymore, but it used to be completely male dominated. And she's just tough as nails. And people would say, yeah, but she'd just laugh at them. Gee, aren't you powerful? <laughs> and she just wouldn't take it on. She just wouldn't take it on. Of course, she was raised with three brothers, so she knows how to push back to obnoxious men. I don't know if this is helpful. Uh, I just want to know that when we are not able to forgive someone, so it will leave an impact on my mind. Yes, we have to learn to practice forgiveness. And the doorway to forgiveness is compassion. And the doorway to compassion is to see what motivates their bad behavior. They are like me. I can be selfish. I can be fearful. I can be angry. I have done hurtful things in my life. And it's always based in fear. For me, I don't think you're any different. But if you and I are that way, the person who said and did the hurtful things, is just like you and me. This is not excuse them, but now I know why they did it. They're a broken, damaged person, which is why they behave that way. Now, if you had some, met someone who had a broken arm or had cancer, you'd have compassion for them. They have an affliction, they have a disease. So that brokenness 
in the heart that causes people to do hurtful things. It's just a spiritual disease. That's all it is. And in the end, it's about them. It's not about you and me. But you're right. We have to forgive because it becomes corrosive to us. I can't do it, Jim. I just don't feel it. Okay. Start by saying the word. I forgive you, I let you go, you're in the hands of God, it is not my job to deal with your karma, your karma will come back to you, that's the Lord's job, not mine, you stay away from vengeance, a revenge. have to forgive them because it becomes a lump and people can hang on to this stuff for decades that's pop is that helpful yes there are no evil people People do evil actions, of course. But why? People do it because they're angry. Why are they angry? Because they're not getting what, they're, what they think they want. Because they're frightened. they're frightened. When we're frightened, we do stupid things. Very, very good question. Thank you. And uh, you can do a prayer like uh, in the morning. I forgive so and so. I give them to God. They're in God's hands. What happens to them is God's business, not mine. I'm having trouble forgiving them, so I ask God to help me. God, grant me forgiveness. Help me. In Yoga Sutra, in the second chapter, the very first sutra is fabulous and it speaks to this. Tapas Vadhyayeshwara Panidana Kriya Yoga. So we start with the middle, Swadhyaya, my own psychological inventory. I can't forgive this person. I have uh, a lump in my heart. Tapas. I will do my best. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I can't do it. I don't feel it. All right. Ishwara Pranitana. Trustful surrender to God. God, I can't do this. I need your help. These three together is yoga in action. Kriya yoga. That starts the whole second chapter, which is the sadhana Bhada. Fabulous, fabulous teaching in that one sutra. All right, next verse. <clears throat> Anad Bhavanti Bhutani Parjanyadana Sambhava. Yagyat Bhavati Parjanyo Yagya Karma Samutpava From food come forth beings, from rain food is produced, from sacrifice arises rain, and sacrifice is born of action. So here Vyasa is talking about the cycle 
of life. And the basic point here is when we operate in the world in this yajna spirit, life is nourished by our actions. And that makes the whole society run better, more smoothly. People are happier. People are more productive. The gods are nourished and they nourish us. So about this idea of rain and food and stuff like that, again, this is all mystic symbolism. The ancients would say that if I do the puja, that's what makes the rain happen and stuff like that. Is it true? Is it not true? I don't know. But the deeper understanding of this from karma yoga is acting in the world according to our inherent latent proclivities in the yajna spirit is what makes for a productive and enriching culture and society? Any thoughts on this? Did you have a thought saying? I thought I heard you both turn. No, just drinking water. Okay. Next verse. I'm sorry. Karma Brahmod Pavam Vitti Brahmakshara Samut Pavam Tasmat Sarvagatam Brahma Nityam Yagye Pratishtitam. Oh, I love this. Know you that action comes from Brahma, Brahmaji, the creator, and Brahmaji comes from the imperishable. Therefore, the all pervading Brahman ever rests in sacrifice. So, little bit of linguistic distinction here. We have Brahma, the creator, masculine noun ending in A. We have Brahman, neuter noun, ending in A-N. They are not the same. Brahman, means consciousness, the ground of being. The unmanifest witness, context for the whole creation. Brahma, the creator, is the same as Prajapati, is the same as Ishwara, the Lord. This is the impetus within consciousness. It's co-eternal with consciousness that sets the whole creation in motion. There is a personal God that's running it. Swamiji used to say it's a cosmos, not a chaos. And if you think your body is real, and especially if you think your personality is real, a personal God is as real as that. So for those of us who are identified with the body, by all means, surrender to God. I can't, he can, I think I'll let him. Very good, simple prayer. So, 
from all of this, everything, as it were, acts in the yajna spirit. If I go across the street, into the park, into the rose garden, they're starting to bud. A rose can only do its rose thing. That's all it can do. It acts fully according to its nature as it's been created. Black holes can only do their black hole thing, pulling all this energy and matter. You and I, as individuals, are part of this great cosmic dance. You can see on the uh, End table there is Lord Shiva seated in meditation. But if you look on the chest in the window, you see Shiva Nakaraj. Lord Shiva is consciousness and he's dancing. And then you have the circle of the flames. It lights up, enlivens higher universe. Now, some people interpret that as he's burning it all down. But understand when Shiva opens his third eye or when Shiva dances and the world is destroyed, again, this is mystic symbolism. For the person in ignorance, I see objects and emotions and thoughts and people, places and things, and they're real and they're separate from me. But for the woman of knowledge, when that yana takshu has opened, sarvam kalvidam brahma, it's all consciousness. Then you've destroyed the world. What do you mean? It's still here. Ah, but I don't see what you see. You see people, places, things, and conditions which are separate from you and misery producing and joy giving. I see it's all gone. That's the deeper meaning of the destruction. So this idea of us spending ourselves in love, how do you like that? That's what we're here to do. Empty it all out. Do it all. Spend yourself in love. Give yourself totally and completely to life. Hold nothing back out of fear. Go for it. That's how we're designed to live. I don't want to be a rose. I think I'd rather be a daisy. Never happens in nature. It's the middle of July. Why haven't you bloomed yet? I'm too afraid to bloom. I'm going to stay as a bud. Never happens. And by the way, what happens after the bloom at the end of summer? What happens to the bloom? Gone. Now it's a rose here. None of these life expressions lasts. Art of life is like a song or a dance. We go through it so short, so, so short. Even if someone has a long life, 80, 90 years, 
I tell you, an entire human life goes by in the blink of an eye. Cheat yourself. Spend yourself in love. That's how we're designed to live. Okay, one more. Evam pravartitam chakram nanu vart. Tayatihaya Aga Yurindriya Ada Ada Yurindriya Ramo Mogam Partha Sajivita Jivati. He who does not follow here the wheel thus set revolving is of a sinful life, rejoicing in the senses. He lives in vain, O son of Katha. So for the person who instead of living this karma chakra as yajna, as sacrifice, serving the society, spending ourselves in love, if on the other hand, our goal in life is cash and prizes, more money, more drug, sex, and rock and roll, more stuff, more attention, more approval, more self-centeredness. All it does is make a person unhappy. And in the end, it rips off society. Over and over again, I say, okay, look at the face of a person like Donald Trump, who openly says, I'm a greedy man. What does he do when he's upset? Destroy my enemies. I'm not making this up. He says this. This is a demoniacal way to live. But just look at his face. He's a tragic figure. He's worth what? Two, three billion? What a happy gambler. Doesn't sleep well at night. Go on YouTube, and there's a young singer. His name is Anthony Leon. He's just now doing the Metropolitan Opera auditions. I found him two years ago online. He's 26, 27 years old. And you can just, watch. first of all, it's a gorgeous voice. But you just watch him when he sings, and he's just transfigured. So much love in what he's doing. It's how we're designed to live. Doesn't mean you need to run away from the world and live on a mountain in a loincloth. That may be what you want to do. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can live in the world doing what you love, but in the spirit of service of young God. All right. What verse are we on for next week? 16. 16. Any final questions or thoughts? Actually, we just finished 16. We're on 17. 17 for next week. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Dachate 
पूर्णस्य पूर्णमाधा पूर्णमेवशिष्य शांति 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 हरि ओम श्री गुरु नम हरि ओम ओम थैंक यू दीपा फॉर गेटिंग अप द क्रैक ऑफ डॉन द चैट